Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Huntington Learning Center's Reading Adventure Reading Live series. My name is India, and I work with children and families all across the country, helping them to get the best education possible. Thank you guys so much for joining us today for Reading Live. This is a series that we do on Mondays and Wednesdays. On Mondays, we offer stories for students that are in kindergarten through third grade. And on Wednesdays, we have stories for students in fourth and fifth grade. So thank you guys so much for joining me today. Today, we're going to be reading a story called The Abominable Snowman. I'm sure you guys have all heard of, heard of The Abominable Snowman before. But this is a little different tale on him and how, how he was found. This is from the book Dragons at Crumbling Castle and Other Tales. If you've been with us here in the last several weeks, we've been reading stories from this book each week. And this is one of the, uh, one of the stories I picked for today. So I hope you guys enjoy it. There was once a young man called Captain the Honorable, Sir Herbert Stephen Ernest Boring Tristram Boring, who was known to his friends just as Bill, and he was very rich indeed. He was also very bored with living in London. One day, a man knocked at his door, pushed past Bill's butler, and asked, Are you Captain the Honorable Sir, and so on? That's me, said Bill. Well, I'm Alfred Tintz, the famous explorer, said the visitor, brushing a heap of $50 bills off the chair and sitting down. Not the man who walked up the Amazon. I am that man, said Tense modestly. Not the man who rode from Brighton to Bombay in the bathtub. I am that man, said Tense, swelling with pride. The man who sailed across the Pacific on a raft made from mahogany and shoelaces and discovered the lost islands of Odium. No, I wasn't that man, actually, said Tense, deflated suddenly. That was another man. Anyway, look at this. <clears throat> he whipped out his wallet and showed Bill a blurred photograph of a white blob in a snowstorm. You know what that is? He asked. That's an abominable snowman. If I had $20,000, I could go and capture it, he said, looking sharply at Bill. Bill signaled to the butler. Give this gentleman $20,000 from the jar in the hall, he said. Excellent, cried Tense. You must come, of course. We'll start tomorrow at dawn. Where to, Mount Everest? Nonsense. That's like Disney World these days. The snowmen are only found on Bend Drumlin. That's a real mountain for you. It's in Chilistan. I must rush. I've got things to do. Bill watched him go. What a strange man twist, he said to his butler. But a genius when it comes to exploring, of course. I wonder where he got that photo. I couldn't say, sir. Shall I pack? Yes, Twist, I think something warm is called for. Hot water bottles, long underwear, and so forth. Chuck a lot of money into a suitcase, too. They had locked up the house and were waiting on the step when Tense turned up the next morning wearing a blue parka and a hat with a pom-pom on it. He was followed by a small Chilistenian man, his guide and interpreter, pulling a suitcase along behind him. There were a lot of reporters asking questions all at once and taking photographs as they ran up. Tense waved them aside and shouted at Bill, just get a taxi, my boy. Bill stepped onto into the road and waved his umbrella. Where to, sir, said the taxi driver as the vehicle pulled up. Chilistan, please. The taxi driver looked puzzled. Is that anywhere near Shepherd's Bush, he asked. Uh, it's about 6,000 miles away. Here's $5,000 to start with, said Bill. The taxi driver paled when he saw all that money. Righto, then, he said. You can't go by taxi all the way to Chilistan, cried Tense. There's an ocean in the way. Bill leaned forward and tapped the taxi driver on the shoulder. I say, old chap, he said. Have you got a passport? Yes, sir. I got it when I went to the Costa Lotto for our vacation last year, said the taxi driver. Bill told him to fetch it, so they drove around to the taxi driver's house, which was number eight, Tramway Place, London. He went inside and reappeared not long afterward, followed by a small, fat woman in a brown coat and a velvet hat stuck full of hat pins. She carried two suitcases. It's my wife, sir, said the taxi driver sadly. She says she's not going to have me gallivanting about abroad without her to keep an eye on me. Sensible woman, said Bill. What is your name, madam? Agnes Glupp she said and curtsied because she knew a gentleman when she saw one. Twist, just shove the lady's luggage on the roof. Get in, madam, are you a good cook? Splendid, I can't boil an egg myself. 
This is all wrong, cried Tense, almost in tears. This isn't the proper way to go exploring. You can't take someone's wife along. Madam, there are abominable snowmen and man-eating plants and dangerous mountains and things like that where we're going. Mrs. Glup just smiled absent-mindedly. Mr. Glup drove down to Dover, and before long, they were bowling through, through France. Head south, said Bill, down to the coast of Lotta. It's sunny there. They drove for ages through cabbage fields. When they reached the coast of Lotta, it was all blue sky, blue sea, and rich people in swimsuits. Oh, I remember this, said Mrs. Glup. Bill bought a small villa for them to stay at, and they all went down to the beach where Mr. and Mrs. Glup waited with their shoes tied together around their necks. Mr. Glup even took off his coat off. Tense, of course, was still wearing his fleece-lined explorer's clothes, which made people stare. Twist, the butler, bought himself a copy of The Times, his favorite newspaper, and settled down to read it while Tense's Chilistenian guide said he wanted to stay with the taxi where he had made himself a home among the suitcases. I see, sir, said Twist suddenly. It says here that a party of Abrovian gentlemen are climbing Ben Drumlin to look for the abominable snowman. I thought we were doing that. Tense almost exploded. Don't get there before us. All my work is in ruins. Let me see that paper, said Bill. Hmm, it says here that those Abrovians have just set out for Chilistan. I reckon we could get there before them. Stop crying, Tense. Twist, find me a telephone. A moment later, he was back and ordered everyone to pile into the taxi. Drive to Nasty Airport, runway three, he said to Mr. Glup. Fifteen minutes later, they were driving up a ramp and through the giant doors of a cargo plane. Their propellers were already spinning. How did you arrange this, gasped Tense. I bought it, said Bill. That's the best part of being a multimillionaire. You don't have to hang around. Oh, I've never been up in the air before, said Mrs. Glup. She sat down and put her hat pinned hat on the table. Except that it wasn't a table. It was a control panel, and she accidentally moved a switch. We appear to be moving, sir, said Twist, the butler. And, sir, there is a uniformed gentleman running along behind us shouting. Hey, sir, I venture to suggest that he is the pilot, sir. The plane trundled along the runway, gathering speed. The wall at the edge of the airfield was getting very near. Has anyone got any suggestions, asked Tense. Everyone stood around looking embarrassed. Then Tense's guy, the small Chilistanian, leaned forward and cautiously pushed the lever. The plane left the ground. He sat down and hit some switches. How did he learn to fly an airplane, asked Bill. Search me, said Tense. When I first met him, he was driving camels. He's clearly a man of many talents. The plane looped the loop twice, dived under some telephone wires, climbed straight upward, and settled down flying more or less properly in the direction of Chilistan. <clears throat> the radio started to crackle frantic messages from the control tower, but their new pilot just ignored them. Soon they were over the sea while Mrs. Glup and Twist prepared lunch in the galley. It took several days to get to Chilistan because they had to keep landing to refuel, usually at little desert airstrips where fuel was bought to the plane on camels. They also got lost for a while around Turkey. I've just remembered something, said Tense, as the Himalayan mountains loomed up. Chilstan hasn't got an airport. That's funny, said Bill. We seem to be landing. Chilistan is a very small country, mostly tropical jungle, stony desert, and mountains. The capital city, Chil Chilblain, lies on the bank of the Red River McPherson, named after the man who claimed to have discovered the country, and it was toward this that the plane was descending. Fishermen on the bank were amazed to see it drop out of the clouds skim over the river, bounce onto the bank, and come to a rest in a thicket of baza trees. The doors opened and a small black taxi shot out at great speed. Then the plane exploded. Not a bad landing at all, said Tense to his guide. I reckon we're ahead of the Abrovians now. Mr. Glup braked on us as a small man in a blue suit dashed up to the taxi. Tense leaped out and shook hands with him, and there started a long conversation in Chilistanian which sounded to Bill like a wet finger being dragged across a window. It's my old friend Godley, the prime minister, Tense explained to the others. He says he'll give us all the help we need. Well, that's pretty decent considering we've just set fire to a splendid thicket of baza trees, said Bill. Yes, but he doesn't like Abrovians because he had an Abrovian camera that broke as far as I can understand it, said Tense. Where is Ben Drumlin? asked Mrs. Glup. Tense pointed. 
The mountain rose out of the jungle and went on rising higher and higher and higher until it just disappeared into the clouds. Good heavens, she said. And is that snow on top? Some do say it's Sherbert, said Tense sarcastically. I don't think we'll have to go more than a third of the way up, though. The abominable snowmen are supposed to live in caves not too far above the jungle. The rest of the day was spent buying warm clothes and hiring porters, and the tropical night had fallen suddenly. Like a brick, when they went to bed at Chilblain's best hotel, Le Grand Manif Magnifique's Ritz Splendide Carlton, Twist the butler had to sleep in the bathtub. Early the next morning, they piled into the taxi again with Twist driving a truck full of porters and provisions. A small crowd gathered to see them off and a brass band played the Chilistinian national anthem, God Save Us All. Then they started off through the forest around Ben Drumlin, the taxi nosing along tiny tracks between huge trees full of brightly colored birds. Monkeys swung through the trees and shrieked and millions of insects hummed and clicked. Up and up the foothills of Benj Rumlin went the little convoy until the lush forest gave way to pine trees and finally to rocks and stunted brushes. bushes. The road just disappeared. There was nothing for it. She just had to walk. Mr. Gluck locked the door of his taxi and hid the key up in his hat. How much farther before we find the abominable snowman, asked Bill, lacing up his climbing boots. Tense struggled to get his backpack on. Another two or 3,000 feet, I suppose, he said. That's where I saw them, by Jove. Doesn't the air smell good up here? Smells like air to me, said Mr. Glup. Onward, cried Tense. They trudged up the slopes of Ben Drumlin, singing songs. At last, they came to a little mountain stream that ran tickling over the stones. Bill bent down to fill his water bottle and heard a whirring noise. There was a tiny water wheel in the stream spinning at great speed, and there was something attached to it, said Tense. It was a small piece of parchment. On it were two lines written in Chilistanian, and Tense translated them. When is a door not a door? When it's a jar. Ha, ha, ha. It's a joke, said Bill. A very old one, too. I've heard that many times before. Extremely so, sir, said Twist the butler. Hmm, said Tense, tapping the paper. You know what this is, don't you? It's a joke wheel. There must be a joke monastery up here and joke monks. He explained to everyone. You see, they think the world was created as a joke. So everyone should give thanks by having a good laugh. That's why they tie jokes to water wheels. Every time the wheel goes around, a joke goes up to heaven. What singular person, said Bill. You mean they spend all their time telling jokes? Yes, they even get up in the middle of the night to invent some more. Someone tapped him on the shoulder. It was a small round man in a blue robe with a bald head and a big grin. Slowly he took a custard pie from one of his voluminous sleeves. Tense duck just in time, it hit twist. It was a curious scene. Halfway up the 27th tallest mountain in the world, the monks stood there laughing while everyone else looked embarrassed and twist stood with custard dripping off his collar. Then there was a green flash, a popping noise, and the monk was gone. Twist blew his nose. Well, said Bill, what a strange man that was. That was one of them, said Tense. I forgot to add that they do magic as well. For the rest of that day, they wandered out up, up Ben Drumlin. They saw no more of the joke monks as they hurried on past large stones and bushes. Although as the stars were coming out, they saw high on a spur of rock a large building. As they passed it, they could hear a sing-song voice telling a joke in Chilistinian and a burst of laughter as the monks saw the funny side. An odd bunch, said Bill, after they pitched camp and were sitting around the fire. It can't be much fun sitting up here all the time inventing jokes. Well, they enjoy it, said Tense. Do you know they reckon that there are over seven billion jokes in the world and that when they've all been told, the world will just come to an end? Like switching off a light, there'll be no more need for it, see? There was silence while everyone sat around thinking or just watching the last of the sunset. The moon rose painting Ben Drumlin's snowy cap bright silver and more stars came out. Like a light, you say? Asked Bill after a while. Yes, or a burst balloon. 
There was another thoughtful pause and they all listened to the monk's laughter floating down from the monastery. I wonder how many there are left. Millions, said Tense reassuringly. <coughs> Screamed Mrs. Glurp, hurtling out of her tent. There's a hairy monster in my sleeping bag. A snowman, screamed Tense. Don't panic, don't panic. Everyone did, trying to hide behind everyone else as the sleeping bag came bounding out of the tent, hopping high into the air and burst. The thing inside landed on Twist's head. It sat there blinking, wide-eyed. That doesn't look abominable to me, said Mrs. Glup. It looks rather sweet. It was about the size of a soccer ball and the same shape with a white coat and a small bushy tail. Two button eyes peered out of the fur. Then it started to cry. Mrs. Glup lifted it down off Twist's head and said something like, Is all frightened by the nasty man, dear, dear? Everyone wondered what she was going on about, but the small snowman seemed to understand. It must be a baby one, said Tense. It coughed and went to sleep. Mrs. Glup made a bed for it out of Tense's backpack, much to his annoyance. Then, wondering how the baby snowman had come into their camp, the explorers crawled into their tents for the night. Bill dreamed that a joke monk was sitting in a bath of custard and telling the 777th billion joke which would bring about the end of the world. The monk went on telling it regardless of the attempts of tents to stop him by throwing sleeping bags at him. Bang! Bill woke up. Everything had gone dark. Something was treading on his stomach. The world has ended, he thought. But no, the tent had just collapsed. Bill squirmed about underneath it and raised a flap. A scene of utter confusion met his eyes. Tents was running around waving a gun. Most of the tents had collapsed and everyone was shouting. It turned out that something large and furry had rushed into the camp and had run off with Twist, the butler. It was also now snowing. It must have been a full-grown snowman, said Tense. Let's get after it. Look at those footprints. Bill looked. There in the snow were prints nearly three feet long, each with three toes. There, he said. Oh, well, I suppose we'd better go. The others relit the fire and sat around in a circle with their backs to it. On guard, as Tense and Bill bundled up in thick clothes and carrying a gun apiece set out by a set, set up out to Ben Drumlin. The footprints scrambled around rocks, leaped over crevices, sidled around along narrow ledges, and disappeared around about lunchtime into a cave. Tense bent down and picked up Twist's bowler hat. He's in there somewhere, he said sadly. After you then, said Bill. He was no fool. He was going to let Tense go first. They sidled into the cave. Tense took a flashlight out of his pack, but all they saw by its light were icicles and damp walls. They tiptoed on and there was no sound but their breathing. Suddenly, Tense tapped Bill on the shoulder. At least that's what Bill thought until he realized that Tense was in front of him. What he thought can be represented by a little sum. He thought Tense equals in front of me. Therefore, he's not behind me. Therefore, it's someone else. This is an abominable snowman's cave. Therefore, the person who just tapped me on the shoulder is a... <laughs> screamed and spun around. It was an abominable snowman, a large ball of fur over six feet high with the biggest feet Bill had ever seen. And there was other snowmen behind it. The leading snowman stepped forward and said something in a light language that was made up of squeaks and grunts. Bill was petrified, but still he spoke. Uh, pardon, said Bill. Furry hands gripped them firmly and pushed them along into a cave lit by candles. Twist was sitting against one wall drinking soup out of a bowl. Good morning, sir, he said. This is a bit presumptuous, isn't it? They've taken me prisoner. Tense and Bill stared around the cave. It was full of abominable snowmen. The leading snowman stepped forward with a stick in its paw and started to draw on the dust at, at Bill's feet. It carefully drew a series of little pictures. The first showed a small snowman running out of the cave. The second was a rough drawing of the explorer's map. Then there was a drawing of Twist and the small snowman. The snowman pointed at the picture and started waving his arms around. Hmm, I may be wrong, said Tense, but I think he's trying to say that they're holding Twist hostage until the baby snowman is returned. 
Yes, but we didn't kidnap him, said Bill. He wandered into our camp. The snowman started to draw again. He made it clear that unless Bill went alone to fetch the little snowman, Tense and Twist would be pushed down a cliff when the sun went down. Oh, said Tense. Well, that's clear enough. Hurry back. The snowman led Bill out of the cave and watched him hurry down the mountain. He skidded across glaciers, leaped over gaping crevices, slid down great drifts of frozen snow, tumbled into icy caves, and finally, puffing and panting, and with blue and pink stars bursting inside his head, he staggered into the camp. Mrs. Glup was trying to feed the snowman a pot of porridge made out of crushed biscuits. Gasping for breath, Bill grabbed the little furry creature and rushed back up the slopes of Ben Drumlin. It made frightened squeaking noises, but clung to Bill's backpack as he climbed sheer cliffs, holding on with nothing but two fingernails and a toe. Finally, he reached the cave just as the sun began to sit, set. Hold everything, he said. He was panting. Here he is. I got him. I found him. There was a great commotion and the baby was hurried away by some snowmen. It was the chieftain's son, explained Tense. The chieftain trotted forward and shook Tense's hand. He pointed at the camera. Pictures, said Tense. Of course. During the next half hour, he took photographs of abominable snowmen standing in formal groups. Abom abominable snowmen with their arms around Bill's shoulders. Abominable snowmen wearing twist bowler hats. Abominable snowmen standing on their heads. Abominable snowmen jumping up and down. And abominable snowmen looking very, very serious. In one photo, an abominable snowman was making bunny ears behind Tense's head with his big paws. This always seems to happen when photos are taken in a large group of people. They didn't actually look very abominable, but Tense seemed happy enough. Just wait till I publish these, he said. They'll make me president of the Royal Zoological Society for this. Then they all shook hands and set off back to their camp. Twist was thinking relieved thoughts, and Tense was thinking excited thoughts, and Bill was just thinking, I wonder how long it will be before the joke monks tell the very last joke. They can't have done it yet anyway. So I hope you guys enjoyed that story of the abominable snowman. Definitely a little bit of a twist on what we would typically hear in an abominable snowman story, uh, but I thought this was pretty good. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, this came from the book, uh, Dragons at Crumbling Castle and Other Tales. It's a great book. It's the one that we've been reading all of our stories from for the last several weeks, and I hope you've been enjoying them. Remember to join us on Monday again. We're going to have stories for students in kindergarten through third grade. Also go to uh, Huntington Reading Adventure, HuntingtonHelps.com, excuse me, to sign up for Reading Adventure and use the hashtag Huntington Reading Adventure this week on social media for your chance to win a gift card. Thank you guys so much. I'm glad you joined me today and I will see you again on Monday. Bye-bye everybody.